I'm staying. I am um, convinced that love, attachment, and fear are a kind of Bermuda Triangle of interpersonal relationships. That they all float in the triangle. And that if you have the triangle, if love is at the apex, attachment and fear are in the two bottom corners, then attachment and fear draw us away from love. Always. Always, always. There's a video going around Facebook of a little boy who appears to be about 10 years old. Uh, he has one leg, and he's catching on a little league team, playing catch. And uh, when, you, when he hits, well, first of all, he's got more balance in his little toe than I have in my whole body. But when he hits, he obviously swings the bat, and then he hops down to first base. And once he's there, they give him his crutches. And he runs the rest of the bases with his crutches. And he even slides. He shows him sliding into second base and, um, you know, fielding balls that have been hit out in front. And he hops out there and grabs them. And, but in order for his parent or parents to let him play Little League, they had to abandon fear. And I'm sure there was a ton of it. You know, what if he gets hurt? And attachment to the outcome. Because I'm sure when he first went out to play Little League with one leg, nobody knew whether this was going to be a good thing or a bad thing, you know, a success or a disaster. Was he going to love it or hate it? Were people going to make fun of him? And so many of us, when we're confronted with those choices, or those choices on behalf of someone we feel responsible for, let fear rule the day. And so the boy gets put in a bubble and doesn't really have the opportunity to blossom. And love is all about wanting to see the other person blossom. It's not at all about what we usually think it is, which are these warm, fuzzy feelings. Now, it can be. I mean, romantic love is about warm, fuzzy feelings. But you can have all the warm, fuzzy feelings you want, and if fear and attachment rule the day, pretty soon we see these situations all the time where it, one partner says to the other, where are you going? Who are you going to see? Say, we're going to be over with the Smiths, and um, be sure you don't say anything about widgets. Because they really don't like widgets over at the Smiths. And if you do, it will reflect badly on me. Well, that's not encouraging someone to blossom. That's, <clears throat> excuse me, encouraging someone to serve you. So often we, we've created this idea in our culture that the one whom I love, I love because of how they make me feel. And should they stop making me feel the way I like them to make me feel, well then I'm not. I'll take them. The problem is that's all about my concern with my own blossoming and using the other as a tool or a fertilizer, and treating them a lot like fertilizer, so that in the hopes that they will help, they will allow me or facilitate my blossoming. It's backwards. And yet our culture is loaded with the language. And our politics are loaded with the same expectations. Because if you look at the conflicts that we have, there's a significant number of people in this country who cannot tolerate dissent. And so what it really be, what dissent really becomes to these folks is a personal insult. It's a disruption of order. It's 
making my life harder. It's causing things to be uncertain, which triggers my fear, which makes me want to shut the situation down because I'm really attached to things working out the way I should. The way I think they should. Because after all, life is supposed to be easy. Bad things shouldn't happen to good people. Good people sublimate their own needs and desires so that nobody else gets upset. And none of that is loving. I'll never forget the good folks at Wisconsin Lutheran College explaining to me that excommunication is a loving act. Okay. Okay. Because if we throw you out of the church, you will see the error of your ways. Maybe. You will change your beliefs or behavior. You will return to the church. And so you won't, won't burn in hell forever. Therefore, our throwing you out was a loving act. And I used to ask them, you know, have you ever been asked to leave somebody's house during a party or something? Did you find that to be a loving act? When when you, if you were in a relationship with somebody and they said, you know, we really shouldn't see each other anymore. At that moment, did you feel like you were respected and, rega and regarded? He said, well, no, of course not. But they couldn't see that when institutions do that, it has the same effect. And they certainly couldn't see that when institutions do that, people have no desire to come back. It's only... A, a masochist who keeps coming to the door to be rejected. And yet, there's a certain expectation that people really ought to do that. At least on behalf of a great number of folks. And what that reflects, once again, is this concern about me and my comfort and my needs. And it may be a lot of things. I mean, there's nothing wrong with having needs. But it isn't love. Because if I want the other to reach their full potential. And the other is currently located in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And they decide that their full potential is in Denver, Colorado. I'm going to be faced with a decision. If I really love them in the sense that I want them to reach their full potential, I'm going to be happy for them and encourage them to do that whether or not I feel like I want to move to Denver. And I may, in fact, say, I'm going to stay in Milwaukee. But love would demand that we give the other room to grow. And that's why I included that first reading that focuses more on compassion. Because I, I think compassion is a huge part of love. And compassion is distinct from empathy. Empathy says, um, I care about what's happening but I really can't do anything about it. So if I have a little squirt gun and I come across a uh, row of shrubberies that are on fire, my squirt gun isn't going to put out the shrubberies. So I might have some empathy for whoever planted them, but I really can't do anything about it. And so the best I can do is say, gee, that's really too bad. On the other hand, if I come across a row of shrubberies that are on fire, and I have a big old hose, I can both say, oh my gosh, it's too bad that this guy's shrubs are on fire, and I can put the fire up. I can impact change. That's the difference. Compassion says, I'm going to do what I can to create the situation that needs to be created, and on the other hand, I'm also going to say that my happiness isn't contingent on things working out the way I believe they should. So I turn on my hose, I go to put out the fire, but I can't. I'm not going to be destroyed, I'm going to say I did the best I could. As a parent raises a contentious teenager, they should learn, usually the hard way, that you can't force them to be responsible. You can't force them to do anything. You can try and create the situation in which they might, but if you are going to hang your happiness 
on their compliance, you're going to be pretty miserable. That's not love. And yet some people would say, lock them up, chain them up, flog them until they submit. There's a huge difference there. And, and it's easy to see, in fairness, why we prefer forcing the outcome that we would, we would like to see. And the reason is, uncertainty isn't very comfortable. You know, uh, we would much prefer a sure deal. Even people who go to Potawatomi on a regular basis would much prefer a guaranteed return. And, and yet, nothing in life gives us that. Prince died this week, uh, 57 years old. And all the, you know, everybody's up in arms. Oh my God, and what do people do? We need to figure out why he died at 57. He must have done something wrong. Because if we can't figure out why he died at 57, everybody who's between 50 and 57 is going to be even more anxious about the fact that they could die any day. Anybody at any age could die any day. But if we obsess about that outcome and can't detach from it and admit that we're not in control of it, we will not live in service of worrying about when we're going to die. If we're in a relationship with another person and we're obsessed with the fact that they may one day decide they don't love us and, and will leave us, we don't enjoy the relationship while it exists. If we're in love with a particular form of government or political party and we're attached to the outcome of an election, we're hinging our happiness on something that's really beyond our control. Non-attachment would say, you do the best you can, you uh, perhaps advocate for the people you believe should be in office, but then you recognize that ultimately you're not in control of the outcome. That's really love. And it's really loving and respecting ourselves enough to say, you know, I'm worth so much more than my ability to force things to work out the way that I think they should, because our ability to do that is really quite small. We are perhaps at our best when we allow the other to reach their full potential, to experience their happiness. And that, strangely enough, frees us to do the same on our own behalf. Amen.